dignity and her self-esteem. It was unfair to ask her to forgive. The least the louse deserved was a steady stream of her scorn and hate. When we ask people to forgive, and when the Bible says we're to forgive, are we being ripped off and betrayed? There's a lot to be said for not forgiving, you know, an awful lot. Why should people cut and thrust their way through our lives and leave us bleeding in the road and then expect us to forgive everything and act as if nothing went wrong? Forgiving is an outrage against dues-paying Americans. And yet, here in this prayer, this awesome prayer, Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And it almost appears at first blush as if Jesus has conditioned his forgiveness of us upon our forgiveness of others. What could this possibly mean? Well, it is interesting to me how quickly the Lord Jesus goes from give us to forgive us. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. It is an interesting thing to me that we could make a case for this being the most important section of the prayer. I think I could prove that to you if I were an attorney because you see it's the only verse in all of the prayer that is repeated for emphasis at the end of the prayer. Look in your Bibles at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12 where Jesus gives this request, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Notice that the prayer goes through the 13th verse and it ends and then when you get to verse 14 Jesus returns to this particular part of the prayer and he says for if you forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses of all the verses in the prayer of all the sections of the prayer this is the only one that Jesus returns to for emphasis it's as if he is saying to us Please don't miss this. This is critical. In fact, someone has said, if you get your arms around this, you can learn how to get along with everybody all the time. <laughs> what an awesome thought. The first thing I note as I look at this part of the Lord's Prayer is that it at least it puts into our computers each day a consciousness of sin. For we're not talking about overspending here when the word uses debt. For it is translated elsewhere as trespasses and in Luke the prayer says forgive us our sins Jesus is not talking about overspending he's talking about those who sin against us those who do evil things he's talking about the evil in the world and if nothing else when we pray this prayer every day it's a good thing for us to remember that we live in a fallen world don't we <laughs> We live in a world that is filled with sin and debt and trespasses and we are all impacted by it. We are all touched by it in some way. You cannot go through a week without feeling the sting of the evil in our world. When I first began to preach in the early church that I pastored, one of the men in our church gave me a book by Carl Menninger. The book was written in 1973. And I will never forget one little section of the book where Carl Menninger said he had done a survey of the historical documents of the United States and that not one single mention have been made of sin since Ike made the mention of it in his inaugural address quoting Abraham Lincoln saying something about the fact that we need to confess our sins and our trespasses to God. Menninger said from that moment until 1973, which was 20 years, there had not been one mention of sin in any of the public documents of our nation. And I dare say it hasn't gotten better since 1973. The only time we hear about sin now is when it's being used to describe the people who should be talking about sin. So at least, if nothing else happens when we pray this prayer, we awake to the realization that is a good realization for all of us that we live in a fallen world but this is not about the consciousness of sin this is about the confession of it Jesus said when you pray pray like this forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and then in Matthew 6 14 and 15 he gives a commentary the idea that is before us is that when we seek forgiveness for our own sin against God for which we are indebted 
that we are to forgive those who have sinned against us. This is pretty heady stuff. Our relationship with the Lord cannot be right until our relationship with others is made right. In fact, Jesus has intimated at this very thing back in the fifth chapter of Matthew when he says in verses 23 and 24, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that thy brother has ought against thee, leave your gift at the altar. That's your God relationship. Forget about your God relationship for a minute and go get your person relationship straightened out. Then come back and get your God relationship right. The Talmud, which is the rabbinical commentary on the Old Testament, says, He who is indulgent toward others' faults will be mercifully dealt with by the supreme judge himself. And isn't it interesting that even later in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, we read, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father. Jesus says if you want to be known as a God child, walk around with the spirit of forgiveness in your heart because that gives you away. And in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers and he says, we're to forgive even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. That's the standard. Proverbs 19.11 says that it is the glory of a man to pass over a transgression. There's something very special about a person who learns about forgiveness. But if Jesus included it in his prayer and commented on it after his prayer, he illustrated it masterfully with the story he told in Matthew 18. This is a familiar story to us. If you want to follow in your Bibles, you can turn to the 18th chapter of Matthew. Kind of follow along as I review the story. Actually, the story itself begins in the 23rd verse. This provides us a final illustration to help us understand what Jesus meant when he taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The text, beginning at verse 15, deals with the issue of forgiveness. But in verse 21, Peter says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times, and Jesus said, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Indefinitely, infinitively unendingly forgive. Then he tells a story in verse 23. He says, there's a kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he has begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now I want to stop there for just a moment. I want to tell you how much 10,000 talents is. 10,000 talents is so much money that it's hard for us even to conceive. For example, one talent could be worth about 6,000 days work. So it would take this man 19 years working six days a week to earn one talent. And he owed 10,000 of them. How could a servant ever get in that kind of trouble? But he did. I don't know if he was embezzling or made bad investments, but he was in terrible, terrible straits. He had nothing with which to pay. If it is hard to believe how he got in that kind of trouble, how stupid he was to get in that kind of trouble, the thing that is even more difficult for us to comprehend is what he said when he was brought before the king. The servant fell down and worshipped the king, and he said, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And when we know how much he owed, and we hear what he says, we almost want to laugh out loud. Sure, right. That's the stupidest thing I ever read. He would have to live 190 years and put every dime he ever earned into his debt, this man was a fool, no matter how you look at it. And so we're filled with angry responses that he would do this and respond this way. Well, you know the story. The Lord decides that he can't pay. The debt is too great. So he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive you all. Now, let's stop for a moment and make sure we have the cast straight. Who does the king represent? God. And who is the servant? All of us. We owed a debt we could not pay, and he forgave. How could he forgive a debt as astronomical as that? How could he forgive a debt that was so great that the only way he could cope with the greatness of it was to send his own son to the cross and let him die? Now the scripture says in the story that once the servant was forgiven, he went out. And some of those who owed him money came to him. 
And while their sum is a paltry sum in comparison to that which he had been forgiven, it was a great deal to those who owed it. And they came and said, we can't pay. Would you forgive us? And the Bible says that the one who had been forgiven so much by the king grabbed hold of them by the throat and demanded that they pay him everything they owe him. And when the other servants saw what happened, they went and told the king. And the king was furious. And the Bible says that the Lord delivered him to the inquisitors. He brought him in and he was thrown in jail. And then the scripture says, and listen carefully, here's the application. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And there's the same word. Do you get that? Do you understand what Jesus is saying? In Matthew chapter 6 verses 14 and 15, in Matthew chapter 18 in the story, what Jesus is saying is we are to forgive others what they owe us because we ourselves have been forgiven so much. And if we will not forgive them, then we will never experience the joy of the forgiveness which is ours. Our forgiveness of others is conditioned upon God's forgiveness of us. And he has forgiven so much, how could there be anything that would be too great that would slip out from underneath the category of God's forgiveness? Now I have written down in my notes next to this passage in Matthew chapter 6 four things and I want to just run them by you quickly because this is what this passage teaches. Number one, it teaches us that we're to forgive because we are forgiven. Number two, it teaches us we're to forgive just as we are forgiven, freely, fully, unconditionally. Number three, we are to forgive that we might be forgiven. That's the gist of the passage. And number four, we're to forgive before we need to be forgiven. Now before we go any further to make application of this to your life and mine, let me ask this question. What is going on here? How can our forgiveness of others in any way condition God's forgiveness of us? Does that not make salvation a work? Does it not sound as if that in order for me to earn God's forgiveness, I have to go out and find everybody who has anything against me and forgive them? Does that not sound as if we have moved away from grace and faith and justification and now slipped back into a salvation by works? I don't think so. How many of you know that there are two kinds of forgiveness? How many of you know that when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, when he came to live within your heart, at that very moment when you made that decision, at that moment there was something that happened in the court of heaven and you were judicially forgiven? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, was applied to your account. Your sins were remitted and taken away. And you then, before God, were viewed as you are viewed now, clean and whole and forgiven. When God in heaven looks at your account and he sees all that you have ever done, over it is stamped, paid in full, forgiven, absolutely, completely forgiven, judicially free. Hmm. Nothing feels more liberating than your sin being forgiven by God. But a close second is the feeling of freedom you experience by forgiving others. Today on Turning Point, Dr. David Jeremiah continues his study of the Lord's Prayer, which focuses on forgiveness in both directions. Sharing the four stages of forgiveness, here's David to conclude his message, Prayer and Personal Relationships. Friends, there's not anything outside of salvation that's more wonderful than to forgive and be forgiven. The Lord Jesus gives us a lot of information about that, not only in the Lord's Prayer, but in some of the illustrations that he used uh, in his parables. It's a terrible thing to live your whole life uh, with an unforgiving spirit. Uh, as many have said, when you refuse to forgive, you don't hurt the person you don't forgive that much, you hurt yourself. Oftentimes when you refuse to forgive the person you should be forgiving doesn't even know they should be forgiven But you're torturing yourself By not forgiving someone who may have hurt you The Bible says as God has forgiven us for Christ's sake We can forgive others out of the reservoir of his forgiveness. We can forgive other people I hope you learn that lesson put it into practice. Maybe today
as a result of being in the Turning Point classroom studying the Bible together with me. We want you to know there's a book that you can get that contains everything we've said in this series and much more. Uh, it's called Prayer the Great Adventure. It's a Multnomah Press book. It's 265 pages, and uh, you can get this book from Turning Point by going to davidjeremiah.org. There is also a study guide you can get at that particular place, and there's a uh, a whole series of CDs you can get in a CD package. Uh, there is a, another resource you can get in a different way. Uh, this one is called Answers to Questions About Prayer. It's a brand new answer book that we have just released from Turning Point. We'd love to send you a copy of this 146-page hardcover book, and we'll do it for a gift of any size during the month of July. Send your gift, and then just say, Dr. J, please send me the book on prayer and you will get it right away. Well, we're ready to begin the last part of this prayer and personal relationships message. Let's go to Matthew 6, 12, and this is Friday, and this is Turning Point. The idea that is before us is that when we seek forgiveness for our own sin against God, for which we are indebted, that we are to forgive those who have sinned against us. This is pretty heady stuff. Our relationship with the Lord cannot be right until our relationship with others is made right. In fact, Jesus has intimated at this very thing back in the fifth chapter of Matthew when he says in verses 23 and 24, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that thy brother has ought against thee, leave your gift at the altar. That's your God relationship. Forget about your God relationship for a minute and go get your person relationship straightened out. Then come back and get your God relationship right. The Talmud, which is the rabbinical commentary on the Old Testament, says, he who is indulgent toward others' faults will be mercifully dealt with by the supreme judge himself. And isn't it interesting that even later in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, we read, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father. Jesus says, if you want to be known as a God child, walk around with a spirit of forgiveness in your heart because that gives you away. And in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers and he says, we're to forgive even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. That's the standard. Proverbs 19.11 says that it is the glory of a man to pass over a transgression. There's something very special about a person who learns about forgiveness. But if Jesus included it in his prayer and commented on it after his prayer, he illustrated it masterfully with the story he told in Matthew 18. This is a familiar story to us. If you want to follow in your Bibles, you can turn to the 18th chapter of Matthew. Kind of follow along as I review the story. Actually, the story itself begins in the 23rd verse. This provides us a final illustration to help us understand what Jesus meant when he taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The text, beginning at verse 15, deals with the issue of forgiveness. But in verse 21, Peter says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times, and Jesus said, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Indefinitely, infinitively, unendingly forgive. Then he tells a story in verse 23. He says, there's a kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he has begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now I want to stop there for just a moment. I want to tell you how much 10,000 talents is. 10,000 talents is so much money that it's hard for us even to conceive. For example, one talent could be worth about 6,000 days work. So it would take this man 19 years working six days a week to earn one talent. And he owed 10,000 of them. How could a servant ever get in that kind of trouble? But he did. I don't know if he was embezzling or made bad investments, but he was in terrible, terrible straits. He had nothing with which to pay. If it is hard to believe how he got in that kind of trouble, how stupid he was to get in that kind of trouble, the thing that is even more difficult for us to comprehend is what he said when he was brought before the king. 
the servant fell down and worshiped the king and he said, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And when we know how much he owed and we hear what he says, we almost want to laugh out loud. Sure, right. That's the stupidest thing I ever read. He would have to live 190 years and put every dime he ever earned into his debt. This man was a fool no matter how you look at it. And so we're filled with angry responses that he would do this and respond this way. Well, you know the story. The Lord decides that he can't pay. The debt is too great. So he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive you all. Now, let's stop for a moment and make sure we have the cast straight. Who does the king represent? God. And who is the servant? All of us. We owed a debt we could not pay, and he forgave. How could he forgive a debt as astronomical as that? How could he forgive a debt that was so great that the only way he could cope with the greatness of it was to send his own son to the cross and let him die? Now the scripture says in the story that once the servant was forgiven, he went out and some of those who owed him money came to him. And while their sum is a paltry sum in comparison to that which he had been forgiven, it was a great deal to those who owed it. And they came and said, we can't pay. Would you forgive us? And the Bible says that the one who had been forgiven so much by the king grabbed hold of them by the throat and demanded that they pay him everything they owe him. And when the other servants saw what happened, they went and told the king. And the king was furious. And the Bible says that the Lord delivered him to the inquisitors. He brought him in and he was thrown in jail. And then the scripture says, and listen carefully, here's the application. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And there's the same word. Do you get that? Do you understand what Jesus is saying? In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, in Matthew chapter 18, in the story, what Jesus is saying is, we are to forgive others what they owe us because we ourselves have been forgiven so much. And if we will not forgive them, then we will never experience the joy of the forgiveness which is ours. Our forgiveness of others is conditioned upon God's forgiveness of us. And he has forgiven so much how could there be anything that would be too great that would slip out from underneath the category of God's forgiveness? Now, I have written down in my notes next to this passage in Matthew chapter 6 four things, and I want to just run them by you quickly because this is what this passage teaches. Number one, it teaches us that we're to forgive because we are forgiven. Number two, it teaches us we're to forgive just as we are forgiven, freely, fully, unconditionally. Number three, we are to forgive that we might be forgiven. That's the gist of the passage. And number four, we're to forgive before we need to be forgiven. Now before we go any further to make application of this to your life and mine, let me ask this question. What is going on here? How can our forgiveness of others in any way condition God's forgiveness of us. Does that not make salvation a work? Does it not sound as if that in order for me to earn God's forgiveness, I have to go out and find everybody who has anything against me and forgive them? Does that not sound as if we have moved away from grace and faith and justification and now slipped back into a salvation by works? I don't think so. How many of you know that there are two kinds of forgiveness? How many of you know that when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, when he came to live within your heart, at that very moment when you made that decision, at that moment there was something that happened in the court of heaven and you were judicially forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, was applied to your account. Your sins were remitted and taken away and you then, before God, were viewed as you are viewed now, clean and whole and forgiven. When God in heaven looks at your account and he sees all that you have ever done, over it is stamped, paid in full, forgiven, absolutely, completely forgiven, judicially free. Can I get a witness? How many of you are glad for that? Isn't that good news? And nothing can change that. Nothing. 
But there's a kind of relational forgiveness that's locked into 1 John 1, 9 and John chapter 13 where we're told the story of our Lord washing the feet of the disciples. Do you remember that wonderful story? And the disciples understood this illustration. It was to illustrate the fact that if you've been washed, you are clean every whit. That's your salvation. But every day when you walk on the earth, your feet get dirty and once in a while they need to be washed and that's relational cleansing. You can't ever fall out of judicial forgiveness, but you can sure fall out of relational forgiveness, can't you? The best story I know to tell you, to help you understand that, is this story out of my own life. When I was a teenager, my father had a Chrysler. Beautiful Chrysler, the nicest car he ever owned. He was a poor preacher, didn't have a lot of new cars, but this was a new car and he was really proud of it. A Chrysler Newport, never forget it. That's when those cars were big old cars, you know, great big old cars. I was not yet at the age of driving, but I was getting close and I thought I was ready. And one day when my dad was gone and my mother was gone, they had gone on a trip someplace, he had left the keys to the car on the table. And I was home alone and I thought, why not? Why not? And young people, if you're listening to me, listen to the whole story, because I got in a lot of trouble. I want you to know this, all right? <laughs> I drove this car, and where I lived in Ohio, out in Cedarville, we didn't have a lot of major highways or paved roads, but we had a lot of gravel roads that went out into the country. And I figured I didn't want to get in a well-traveled place where somebody would see me, so I went out on a gravel road, and I was testing out this car, man, and its power, and it was awesome. And it was kind of dusty because of the dust. All of a sudden, I looked up, and some farmer in his farm truck was coming the other way. And he either didn't see me or he didn't care because he took his half out of the middle. And the next thing I know, that wonderful Chrysler was in the ditch on the side of the road. The front of it was all messed in and wrinkled up, and I was sick. I knew I was in big trouble. <laughs> and pretty soon a farmer came along, and he had a tractor, and he pulled me out. Somehow I got that car home. I think if I remember right, I could only turn left. I had to keep turning because I couldn't turn the other way. I got the car home and I put it in the driveway and then I had to wait. Oh, the awesomeness of the wait. <laughs> would God he would have come home when I did, but several hours later my father came home. And I'll never forget it. I was looking through the window in my bedroom watching. My dad walked out. And he just stood there like frozen for a few minutes and then he walked in. And he walked by me and he said, David, did you do that? I said, yes, sir, I did. I expected some bad things to happen. <laughs> he didn't say a word. I'm not kidding you. I was shocked he didn't say a word. He just shook his head and walked into the bedroom, left me sitting there. He didn't say a word at dinner. He didn't say a word at breakfast, <laughs> at lunch at dinner the next night. Two days passed, not a word. Suddenly it hit me, this is my fault. So I went to his office. He was the president of the college there. And I knocked on the door and he looked, he was kind of surprised. I said, can I talk with you? He said, yeah. I said, dad, I'm really sick about what I did. I was deceitful and I was wrong. And I know we don't have the money to be dealing with this. And I disappointed you. And I ruined our trust. And I guess what I want to say is I'm sorry and will you forgive me? He got up and came around from the desk and put his arms around me and hugged me and he said, David, you are forgiven and you will pay for the car. <laughs> now the question I want to ask you is this. When I was experiencing the silence of those days, was I still my father's son? Was I? He may have had thoughts about that, but was I? <laughs> Was I still, I mean, judicially, was I my father's son? Was I? I was judicially forgiven, but was I relationally forgiven? No. And what I had to do is go and get it right now. Here's what Jesus is saying. Listen up. He's saying, if we as believers don't deal with the forgiveness issues in our lives with other people, we will not be able to go to God and receive the relational forgiveness that we seek when we get our feet dirty walking on this earth, it will get in the way. It will be very hard for us to say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done because immediately we'd be reminded of those who are seeking that same thing from us. God wants us to take his forgiveness given to us and pass it out to those who need it in our lives. And Lewis Smead says, Jesus grabs the hardest trick in the bag. 
forgiving. And he says we have to perform it or we're out in the cold, way out in the boondocks of the unforgiven cold. He makes us feel like the miller's daughter who was told that if she didn't spin gold out of a pile of straw before morning, she would lose her head. And no Rumpelstiltskin is going to come and spin forgiving out of our straw hearts. And Jesus is tough on us because Jesus knows, he knows that it is a matter of incongruity to receive his forgiveness and not offer it to others. So the only way you can heal the pain of the hurt that will not heal itself is to forgive the person who hurt you. Forgiving stops the reruns, have you noticed? Forgiving heals your memory and changes your memory's vision. When you release the wrongdoer from the wrong, you cut a malignant tumor out of your life. You set a prisoner free and then you discover the prisoner you set free was you. American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr saw this after World War II and he said, we must finally be reconciled with our foe lest we both perish in the vicious circle of hatred, end of quote. So you say, Pastor Jeremiah, that's great and I understand what you're saying, but how does this work? How do we go about doing this? I just want to say three or four things to you that I think are helpful. There are four stages, basically that you go through. First of all, when you're trying to figure out how to deal with forgiveness and the act of forgiveness, the first stage you go through is the stage of hurt, isn't it? I mean, it hurts. When somebody causes you pain so deep and unfair that you cannot forget it, you are pushed into the stage of hurting, stage number one of forgiveness. Because you see, if you don't hurt, you can't really deal with forgiveness. How many of you know people that are flippant in their forgiveness? Uh, I forgive you. I forgive you. They don't know what forgiveness is all about. It's just kind of a, you know, a vocal pause. But forgiveness starts with the feeling of the pain. And then after hurt, I'll be honest, comes hatred. You cannot shake the memory of how much you were hurt and you cannot wish your memory well, and you sometimes want the person who hurt you to suffer like you are suffering. And whether you like to admit it or not as a Christian, you go through the process of hate, and you start making up speeches you'd like to give if you have the chance. And you construct little scenarios where they're walking along the highway on a dark night, and you're driving along and no one's around, and you, there's your chance. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You go through this whole thing. <laughs> Hatred. And then comes stage three, healing. You're given, as someone said, the magic eyes to see the person who hurt you in a whole new light. Your memory is healed and you turn back the flow of pain and you're free. And you say, I feel the hurt, I've experienced the hate, but by the grace of God, I forgive. And then the last stage is the coming together again. And sometimes that person gets back into your life. Sometimes that person can't come back into your life and you have to be healed all by yourself. But that's the process. And that's what Jesus is teaching. He's saying, every day when you pray, pray like this. Forgive us our debts, Lord, as we forgive our debtors. Lord, as we forgive those who have hurt us, we accept the forgiveness you have offered to us. Remember I said there were four things. We forgive because we have been forgiven. We forgive just as we have been forgiven. You remember that? Then I didn't give you the fourth one. The fourth one is we forgive before we need to be forgiven. And I never thought about that before, but if we pray this prayer every day, isn't that true? Every day we get up and we pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. You know we need our daily bread, Lord. And Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Present tense, Lord, sometime today, somebody's gonna do something that will be mean and nasty and hurtful. Create within me a, a forgiving heart, a forgiving spirit, and then try this one on. You walk out of your prayer closet and you're not out on the highway very long before somebody does it. I mean, they do it. <laughs> and they look at you and before they can speak, you say, I've already forgiven you. You what? 
Yes, I did it this morning. You did what? When I was praying this morning before I got out on the highway, I forgave you. I didn't do it until five minutes ago, I know, but I forgave you ahead of time. You're weird. <laughs> But can you imagine that? Can you imagine just kind of every day creating within yourself that kind of a spirit? Forgiveness before you need to be forgiven, before you need to offer it. Jesus said that those who live by God's forgiveness must imitate it and that our only hope is that we will come to grips with this truth that we cannot hold the faults against others when our faults have not been held against us. Our forgiveness is conditioned upon the forgiveness that we have received. It is very seldom that a poet captures the essence of a passage of scripture. I think they used to write poetry like that a lot more in days past than we do now. But of all the passages I have taught, here is a poetic reminder that is very close to the heart of its truth. Forgive our sins as we forgive. You taught us, Lord, to pray. But you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. How can your pardon reach and bless the unforgiving heart that broods on wrongs and will not let old bitterness depart? In blazing light, your cross reveals the truth we dimly knew how small the debts men owe to us, how great our debt to you. <laughs> That's it. The secret, the real secret of forgiving others is the cross of Jesus Christ. Whenever you're feeling like it's too big, too hard, too tough, too awful to forgive, go to the cross and remember that there was a day in order that we might be forgiven that the Son of God hung there between heaven and earth and poured out his life's blood for us and forgave us of all our debts. And now in the light of that and in the power of that and in the spirit of that, we can turn to others and say, you are forgiven and I forgive you. Well, amen. Amen. Uh, I think this might be the most... Um, powerful part of the prayer and I think I've heard more about this part of the prayer than any other part simply because when people get a hold of the concept of this particular section and begin to put into practice the beautiful experience of forgiving and being forgiven everything in life changes I hope that will be true for you uh, as you forgive those who need to be forgiven and accept the forgiveness of others. Well, we'll take a break for the weekend. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about... In the only mention of Job in the New Testament, Almighty God gives us a clue as to God's purpose for Job's suffering. In James 5.11, you read these words, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. This verse indicates that Satan's purpose was to try to get Job to be impatient and to give up. Job became impatient with himself. Later on, he becomes a little impatient with his critical friends. But he never lost faith in his God. Though he did not know what God was doing, he did not know what he could do about what God was doing. He did know that he could trust God. In essence, especially to his wife, Job mirrored the compassion and the mercy of his God. How many of you know that when you're going through tough times, one of the things you really need more than anything else is patience? When you're under pressure and you feel the weight of the pressure, if you're not careful, you're flying off in every direction and you're ending up acting in a way that you don't normally act. By the way, did you know that the only way you can learn patience is through going through trials? I didn't make that up. Over in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says it just as clearly as it can be said. Listen to this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So here's some advice from your pastor. Don't pray for patience, because if you do, you will get tribulation. That's how God gives patience to his people.
Horatio Spafford was a very prosperous senior partner of a successful law practice. Prosperous and successful, that is, until the great Chicago fire, which destroyed much of his wealth, along with most of the city of Chicago. Horatio remained in Chicago after the fire to finish a case that was pending, and his family set out for Paris. He was to join them later. On November the 21st, 1873, the luxury ocean liner taking Anna Spafford and their four daughters to Europe was rammed by another vessel, and in less than 20 minutes, it sank. An unconscious Anna Spafford was rescued from some floating debris, but all of the children perished. While on the way to be with her in Europe after he received her note that all the children had been lost at sea, Horatio asked the captain of the ship on which he was traveling to alert him to the place along the way where this tragedy had occurred. And he went up and cried out to the Lord and went back to his cabin and wrote down on a piece of hotel stationery from Chicago, wrote down the words to the song, It is well with my soul. Almost familiar as his song are the words of Anna's telegram to her husband. When she was notifying him of what had happened, she sent simply these words, Saved alone, what shall I do? To a fellow survivor, she said, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday, maybe I will understand why. When we last left Job, he had lost his children. Not four daughters, but seven sons and three daughters. They were swept away when the house in which they were having a party was struck by a tornado and the house collapsed on them, killing them all instantly. The loss of Job's ten children was the final stroke in Satan's first attack against him. In round one, Job lost all of his possessions and all of his family except for his wife. Now at this point in the story, at the end of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two, the central question of this book shifts. It shifts from the question, can a man lose everything he has and still bless God, to can a man lose even what he is and still remain under God's blessing. So we begin the second chapter with Job accused by Satan. And in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2, we read these words. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, though you incited me against him to destroy him without cause? Using the same words that we are familiar with from the first chapter, we are told that Satan returns and is in the presence of Almighty God along with God's ministering angels. As in the first meeting, God initiates the conversation, and he turns to Satan and he says to him, What do you think of my man Job now? <laughs> I let you give him your best shot, but Job hasn't cursed me. <laughs> no, in fact, he hasn't cursed me. He's actually blessed me. Satan, I'm telling you, there is nobody like Job on the face of the earth, and you will never break him. But how many of you know Satan doesn't give up easily? <laughs> Can I get a witness? If he would not give up on Jesus Christ until after he had tempted him three times, he's not going to give up on Job after one, and he's not going to give up on us either. 
And so we learn, first of all, about Satan's persistence. And then we learn about his persuasion. In verses 4 and 5, we read these words. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan says to God, God, I went as far as you'd let me go. I took away Job's possessions and I took away his family, but that's all you allowed me to do. Job still has his health, God. And because of that, he can get another family and he can start another business. But I'll tell you what, Lord, if you let me touch his health, he will curse you to your face. He's accusing Job of sacrificing his children, his animals, and his servants in order to preserve his own hide. Satan was convinced that Job would give all he had for his own life. In other words, Satan is saying that Job only loves God because God protects him and keeps him healthy. So he says, God, you let me take away Job's health? <laughs> That'll be it. He'll curse you then, Lord. He'll curse you to your face. And so we move from Satan's persistence and his persuasion to his permission. Notice verse 6, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. God issues Satan a permission slip with virtually unfettered power to harm his body, but God restricted Satan and would not let him kill Job. Now it's important to know, before we go any further, that God is always in control. Satan could not do anything that God would not let him do. And God is allowing Job to be a test, to be a, a testimony, if you will, to a man's ability to trust in his God when all the props are taken away. But mark it down, Satan doesn't have unrestricted power. He can't do what he wants to do. He has to get permission from God. So we move from his persistence and his persuasion and his permission. Now notice his persecution in verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Satan afflicted Job with a disease. We do not know for sure what that disease was. It is identified primarily in the text in a very graphic form. He had painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He was covered with sores. The Hebrew word for the word boil means a burning sore. The word is used for the boils with which the Egyptians were smitten in the plagues of Exodus chapter 9. Job was covered with these burning inflamed sores from his foot to his head. The disease was likely the dreaded black leprosy of the Near East, often referred to by the title elephantiasis. The name for elephantiasis comes from the fact that the limbs in this disease take on a dark color from heavy incrustation due to the sores and the extreme swelling, which makes the limbs of the person, uh, the, their limbs look like elephant's legs. And they say the suffering with this disease is absolutely indescribable. If you read through the rest of the book of Job, you will run into some of the things Job was feeling and the, the symptoms of his disease. I just made a list of a few of them, and I, I won't ask you to look them up, but let me just tell you what they are. We begin in the second chapter with boils in verse 7, severe itching, verse 8, degenerative changes in his facial skin, verse 12 of chapter 2. In chapter 3, we discover he's lost his appetite, and he's full of depression, verses 24 and 25. In chapter 9, he has difficult breathing. In, a, in 19, he has foul breath. In 19, he also has the loss of weight and continual pain and fever. These are just a few of the things Job was experiencing because Satan was allowed to touch his body. Apparently, as we read the text, and this is a little bit gross, but it's right here, and I have to tell you about it. Apparently, Job found relief from the itching by scraping himself with a piece of broken pottery. So now we see Job outside of the city, sitting on an ash heap. 
the city garbage was deposited and burned there and all of the rejects lived at the dump at the ash heap dogs fight over something to eat and the city's waste is brought and burned and the city's leading citizen job is now sitting at the dump on an ash heap outside of the city before we leave this section i want to take just a moment and share a couple of summary paragraphs about satan because we run the risk right here of either giving him more credit than he deserves or not giving him enough. I came across a couple of paragraphs by a Welsh preacher by the name of Peter Williams and he writes this. He says, we are sometimes in danger of adopting one of two extremes where Satan's power is concerned. On the one hand, we overrate his power and treat him as if he were almost equal to God. <laughs> he is not. For he is a created being, and he does not possess God's attributes of omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. The limits of his power may be seen in the fact that he can only do to Job what God allows him to do. But even greater is the danger of underestimating his power, which is also very extensive. The first two of Satan's attacks upon Job are connected with his manipulation of men. He uses the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans to do his work. The second two temptations shows his control over the forces of nature, the fire and the wind. And the last temptation uses sickness of his subject's body to get across his point. For all of his sinister cunning and power, Satan is a created being. And therefore he is no match for the sovereign God who created him. He is the enemy of our souls, and he will use every means at his disposal to bring about our destruction. But we must never forget that he is already a defeated enemy. And all the vicious attacks upon the believer are but counter-offensives that are doomed to failure. Let me tell you something, friends. Satan was sentenced at the cross of Jesus Christ. The sentence hasn't been fully carried out, but one day it will. In between the sentence and the judgment, we're living in that period of time, and Satan's kind of on the loose. And he's a frantic, desperate creature because he knows his days are numbered. <laughs> so don't be taken aback by Satan. Keep your guard up. But don't let him make you believe that you have to do anything he tells you to do. He reports to Almighty God. And he can't do anything that God won't allow him. And the Bible says there has no temptation taken us, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not suffer us to be tempted above that we are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. We can be victorious over Satan, and he does not have power over us to do anything that we don't open the door of our lives to let him do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Job, accused by Satan. But now, we got to talk about the second part of the story. And I've been looking forward to this with fear and trembling. <laughs> We're going to talk about Job's wife. We read, first of all, of her advice in verse 9. Then Job's wife said to him, Job, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? I read a lot of books when I'm studying a series like this, and I love to read Chuck Swindoll's books because <laughs> he sits loose in the saddle. <laughs> and he always wants to make sure that while we deal with serious things, we don't get too serious. And right here in his book, he tells this story. He said there was a couple in bed one night, and the husband got up in the middle of the night, and he, and he went downstairs. And after he'd been gone for a while, his wife realized that, that he should have come back. And she gets worried, and she goes downstairs. She walks in the kitchen, and he's sitting at the kitchen table drinking a cup of coffee, staring out of the window. She says, honey, what's wrong? He said, oh, nothing. He says, she says, no, no, you wouldn't get out of bed and come down here in the middle of the night and sit in the kitchen, drink coffee, and stare out the window if it wasn't something wrong. What's wrong? He says, well, he said, the words don't come easy. And as she walked over to see him, she saw he was crying. He said, you remember 20 years ago when we had our first date? Do you remember the night we were sitting out in front of the house and we were smooching? <laughs> And your dad saw us, and he went back in the house, and he came out with a pistol. <laughs> and he put the pistol in the window, and he said, anybody who kisses my daughter like that will either marry her 
or spend 20 years in prison. And he said, I just realized tomorrow was the day I would have gotten out. <laughs> now, I have to recover from that very quickly. Because I sort of noticed that the majority of the laughter sounds sort of masculine. I don't, I don't see a lot of ladies laughing at that. But I wanted to tell you that because the rest of this is interesting, to say the least. After Satan struck the first time against Job, all Job had left was his wife and his friends. Now we read that even his wife has abandoned him. You cannot imagine how painful that must have been to the patriarch. Chrysostom, a church father who was not supposed to have any sense of humor about this at all, wrote that the only reason Satan didn't kill Job's wife when the rest of his family was killed was because he knew he was going to use her later on to do some more damage to Job. <laughs> and the most difficult thing to accept about the seventh verse of this chapter is the fact, if you look at it carefully, Job's wife asked Job to do exactly what Satan wanted him to do. Did you see that? Satan wanted Job to curse God and die. And she said to him, why don't you curse God and die? One of the things we have to be careful about here is to recognize that even though people are close to us, sometimes they can give us wrong messages. Adam listened to Eve. Abraham listened to Sarah. Job's wife advised him to give up his faith and commit suicide. But I want to tell you something. There's another side to this story that we need to be careful to mention. Before we throw Job's wife under the bus, I'd like to try to put this whole scene in perspective. Don Baker has written a book called Pain's Hidden Purpose. And in that book, he has written these words. He says, many have speculated as to just what Job's wife may have meant when she looked at that emaciated and blackened body and suggested that Job end his suffering. Some see Job's wife, he wrote at this point, as hardened and bitter, unconcerned for his relationship with God. I see her, wrote Don Baker, as a sensitive, caring, concerned woman who loved Job and honored his commitment. No family could have enjoyed the oneness that Job's family shared if their mother had been calloused or cruel. But she was stretched at this point. Weeks of suffering had passed without relief. Every morning she woke up to the same pain, only to find it intensified. Every night she'd pray for her husband's healing, but it never came. And there was no medication, no Tylenol-3, no Percodan, no Demerol, no morphine to ease the pain, no Valium, not even an aspirin to help him go to sleep. His suffering was so intense, his looks so hideous, his condition so infectious, that he was forced to move out of the house and relocate at the city dump. And she couldn't stand it any longer. In a moment of deep and frustrated anguish, she suggested, Job, why don't you curse God and die? Tell God you've had enough. He's not going to heal you. He's gone back on his promise. He's not even aware of your problem. Job, I'd rather see you dead than like this. Maybe we could die together. End of quote. It's hard to blame this woman, isn't it? When you realize what she was experiencing. But to his credit, Job didn't listen to his wife's advice. He gave a solid answer in verse 10. He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job's response here was profoundly simple. It was filled with deep insight. As you read the language, here's basically what he said to her. He said, woman, don't talk like a foolish person. You're talking like an unbeliever. <laughs> don't do that. Shall we accept good from God, he said, and not accept his adversity? And he rejected her suggestion. Job was slowly, methodically, being stripped to the very nakedness of his spiritual being. All the things that clothe the spirit of man were being ripped apart 
all that man leans upon for help and strength was taken from him until we now see this man left alone, a soul that was forced to stand naked in the universe of God. All the props removed. I want to stop for just a moment and put a little counsel in here if I might. I want to take just a moment and remind all of us now that we've done away with all of the ups and downs of Job's wife and just say to the wives here, don't ever, ever underestimate your importance to your husband. Don't ever think your words of affirmation are less important than others. I promise you, your husband cares more about what you say than what anybody else on the earth says. And especially when you're going through times that are stressful and difficult, he needs you, and without you, he probably won't make it. Sometimes when difficulty comes, couples have a tendency to pull apart. But if you read the scripture and follow God's way, you will know that when difficulty comes, godly couples come together. And they face the trauma and difficulties of life as a team. And they go through and come out victorious. I remember reading about a time when Martin Luther was going through a very difficult time in his life. He was being criticized by everybody. And, and he was overwhelmed. And, and like sometimes happens, he got really depressed. His wife realized how serious things had become for Martin. And she decided that she would do something to help him come out of his depression. So she put on a black dress and began to express herself like as if she was in mourning. She went about her duties in the house with a terrible look of sorrow on her face. And Luther was startled by her appearance and he said to her, Who died? She said, Oh, God did. God died? What in the world do you mean, woman? She said, well, the way you've been acting, God must be dead. And all of a sudden, Luther got the point, And he came out of his depression. Now, I don't know how creative you ladies are, but that's certainly one you can't use because I've told everybody about it. But uh, <laughs> there's all kinds of ways to encourage your husband and to help him see things as he should. So we've come through the first two sections of the second chapter, Job accused by Satan and abandoned by his wife, and now we come thirdly to Job assaulted by his friends. And we read in the second chapter of Job, now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar, they did not recognize him, and lifted their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven, and they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Now today, whenever you say the phrase, Job's comforters, what you mean is you're talking about somebody whose counsel only makes you feel worse than you did before they came. Most of the commentary about Job's friends is negative, but let's take a moment and think about the good things that they did. First of all, they came to Job when he was in trouble. You know, it's easy to be a friend from afar off, but these three guys got together and they went to where Job was. And there was some kind of commitment on their part. They made an appointment, it says, together to go and see Job. And they also had hearts of compassion when they saw him from afar they were taken back by his appearance and they began to weep. The intensity of their mourning was the kind usually reserved for death or total disaster. The Bible says they tore their robes and they wailed and they threw dust into the air. And then the wisest thing they did, they kept quiet for seven days. They didn't say a word. Joseph Bailey is a man who suffered a lot in I have a number of his books. He's got a book about death and, and how you, you face it with other people. And, and he wrote this little paragraph. He said, I, I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved except to wish he'd go away. <laughs> he finally did. 
Another came and sat beside me. He just sat beside me for an hour or more, listened to what I was saying, and answered briefly, prayed for me, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. <laughs> Many of us have observed that Job's friends made up for their silence later. <laughs> and they sure did. And as you read the rest of this book, you discover that the dialogue between Job and his friends was basically negative. They saw Job in the midst of his anguish. They saw the horrific picture of a reeking dump and heaps of ashes and smoldering fires and stench and buzzing flies and scampering rats and all the other ruins of civilization. Even before Job opened his mouth, his friends had already formed a clear opinion as to what his problem was. Was it not clear to all the world that a man whose body was rotting away like this must be a terrible sinner? And in the chapters that are ahead, they're going to accuse Job of that. They were totally wrong. But that's what they decided was the problem. Now, as we review these chapters that we have studied, these two chapters, I want to take just a moment at the end of this sermon and ask what do we learn from watching this man go through this incredible time of anguish. There are three principles I want to leave with you. Put them in your notes. Most of all, put them in your heart. They are found in the first two chapters of Job, but they're also all located in one verse, in the tenth verse of the second chapter. So let me share with you what they are. First of all, trials teach us patience. Job turned to his wife and he said to his wife, You speak as a foolish woman speaks. Patience is the passive side of endurance. In Job's answer to his wife, he demonstrates his patience. He doesn't scold her. He doesn't rebuke her. He does not try to put her down or respond to her in a negative way. He reasons with her. And he tries to help her see God through his eyes. In the only mention of Job in the New Testament, Almighty God gives us a clue as to God's purpose for Job's suffering. In James 5.11, you read these words, Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. This verse indicates that Satan's purpose was to try to get Job to be impatient and to give up. Job became impatient with himself. Later on, he becomes a little impatient with his critical friends. But he never lost faith in his God. Though he did not know what God was doing, he did not know what he could do about what God was doing. He did know that he could trust God. In essence, especially to his wife, Job mirrored the compassion and the mercy of his God. How many of you know that when you're going through tough times, one of the things you really need more than anything else is patience? When you're under pressure and you feel the weight of the pressure, if you're not careful, you're flying off in every direction and you're ending up acting in a way that you don't normally act. By the way, did you know that the only way you can learn patience is through going through trials? I didn't make that up. Over in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says it just as clearly as it can be said. Listen to this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So here's some advice from your pastor. Don't pray for patience, because if you do... 